welcome to my homestead and welcome to my channel. Today I'm talking to Troy Abels from the Last Dispensation channel. Uh, it's been a while since I've talked to him. Uh, you know, recently I've been more focused on like I've been asking females in the church if they want to start up YouTube channels uh, because I'm trying to support that because of the last general conference. So if you're somebody, if you're a sister in the church and you're thinking about doing a YouTube channel, contact me. Uh, we'll do an interview. I have one coming up in August, but um, anyway, so I've mostly been doing that, but it's been a long time since I've talked to you, Troy. It's good to have you. Have it's you good back. to be with you. Yeah. Um, you've uh, you are doing some amazing things over there. Uh, I. Uh, I've, is there anything that you want to talk about in particular? Um, not in particular. Um, what What is it like? What are some of the big videos that you've done re recently on your channel that have like kind of stood out to you? Well, uh, you know, it's interesting. The 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 Joseph Smith uh, daguerreotype has been an interesting topic, <laughs> yes, to say the has. least. I saw that it it kind of uh, my last video just started blossoming, just booming um on um on that topic i know that midnight mormons did something on it as well and then you you did something uh similar to to that yeah uh, i don't know Do, are you feeling that that's the prophet space <laughs> i'm well, not really sure i don't know when i first saw it, i was like that doesn't look like him at all based on you know the typical pictures that we see of him so what i decided to do in my video is you know I, i'm all about photoshop because that's my main job as right a graphic right designer and so i took the death mask and i matched it up to his face and um there were some things that matched up pretty nicely um and then i looked at the i guess like the portrait that someone made of him uh because even though portraits can be off obviously because it's like someone trying to imitate somebody's face um they can pick up little details so there were a few details that seemed to be picked up in that portrait but i just i don't know this is like one of those things like uh the whole like debate between you know where did the book of mormon take place was it mesoamerica or the right. heartland and it's like i don't, I don't really care <laughs> i think right. it's interesting i don't mind like yeah. looking into it but i just i don't have a strong opinion well, so yeah, I noticed that. OK, so a lot of the comments, I love going and reading comments, and I know that you do, too, because you've talked to me about how you've learned a lot from your uh, subscribers. And I yeah. have, too. And even people yeah. that aren't subscribers, I've gotten a lot of comments from people that aren't members of the church. Mm -hmm. But I notice a difference in some of those who I feel. Um, and you could see it in their language that they're. They have testimonies of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And there's a difference in the those who are speaking about how they, they're, they're either not sure or they say this is not the prophet's face. And the reason is not because of proof, mm -hmm. not because it's it's got a 90 percent match up with the uh, what are they? What is that called? when they're measuring the eyes and the brow and the nose, is um, that something that you were, you were just kind of superimposing the mask over the face, right? Yeah. Which is kind of, I know I there's know a how, technical term for that, but I, forgot I don't know how it good it was. Cause like some people, after I did the video, some po people pointed out that, you know, when he fell from the window, there could have been damage done uh, to his face and then, right the act of dying can kind of change your face. And then on top of that, uh, someone pointed out that they may have put like cotton or something in his nose uh, to kind of make it not collapse. I, I think someone said that and I was like, okay, well maybe cause like uh, the death mask, like the nose is kind of like more the, the bulbous, bulbous tip. Yeah. A lot more than the photo or the daguerreotype yeah. showed. But yeah. I, I noticed the difference in the comments with those who have an affinity, in other words, a feeling for the prophet Joseph Smith as a prophet. And they kept saying the same thing. I don't feel that this yeah. is the prophet. I don't feel. And then you, you would have those 
other members of the church that that weren't being they weren't being um what's the word i'm trying to look for uh like completely disagreeable in a disagreeable way what's the word i'm looking for <laughs> antagonistic or whatever there were those yeah. too but there were members of the church that are like well i think it's the prophet because of some of the proof that that's been out there i guess there's a video uh, uh, but then there's this website that's charging on Amazon for a book or it, some, somebody's profiting on this somehow. Yeah. I, I need to find out a little bit more about that before I just blabber on about that. But, uh, I, I was, I was surprised, uh, by how many, cause it, this was one of my videos that did a little bit, uh, better than average in terms of views, but also comments. And I was kind of surprised, like how many people, felt so strongly about it because like i said i i don't really care that much i just think it's kind of interesting but there like everybody was coming out of the woodworks to comment right on, on my video that i did about it i did a poll uh do you want me to tell you the results of the yeah poll? absolutely let me uh pull that up really quick um i i like to do polls and stuff like that uh i want to do more but um i haven't checked on it for a few days. So let me see. Okay, according to my poll, I have 455 votes in <clears throat> as of right now. And 43% say yes, they think that it's Joseph Smith, and then 57% say no. So it looks like uh, according to that poll anyway, the no's have it. Do you notice the difference like in, have you polled like how many are members of the church, how many are active members? How many, um, like, if you ask them, um, do you believe the prophet or that Joseph Smith is a prophet of God? So I'm, I'm kind of curious about that. That would be an interesting, like, to break yeah. it down into categories like that to see what that 40, what was it, 47% said yes. Yeah. And the other 53% was said it 53 no. said no. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which one of those is, are, are believers in the prophet Joseph Smith as a prophet and how many of those are, uh, you know, don't yeah. believe in it or, or don't have testimonies of the gospel. That would be, that's actually a really good idea. I've never thought about doing that before. Cause maybe I'll just do like a general poll. Um, cause that, that's something that Google analytics or YouTube analytics can't tell you. Right. Right. <laughs> right, right. So Maybe, I, yeah, I think I'm going to do a poll about that um, to find it. Because I'm, I guess in my mind, I assume that virtually everybody is members of the church. But I, 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 I know that I do have people from other faiths that occasionally watch my videos. And I, I guess it'd be interesting to find out if any of them have subscribed. So, yeah, I'm going to do that poll. That's a I good think, idea. Yeah, it is a good idea. The, the reason I asked that or brought that up is because some of the comments that were leaning more toward uh it being the prophet some of the people seemed kind of antagonistic for some reason or that they were well they kept making comments like um if you haven't watched the the uh the videos on the proof of or or looked at the 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 uh the studies that they've done, I guess, apparently they studied it for two years and uh, came up with some, you know, that this was a 90% match, which still isn't, <laughs> I mean, you can, I've seen other things where people have matched up faces and they were completely two different people. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. You can do that. So the matching of the face, like the, the measurements of the eyes to the bridge of the nose to the nose to the top of the lip you know all of those and the ear levels with the eyes isn't always accurate yeah no uh it is one way that you can say no this is not this person because like obviously if someone has like uh like the distance between the lip and the nose like if it's like short and the person you're looking at has a long distance then you can be like oh yeah this is definitely not that right. person. so but as far as like affirming it you're right uh that's a little bit more tricky yeah and um not to keep beating this 
uh, topic, but I, 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 I know that you're an artist. You, I mean, you do graphic design. You understand the human anatomy, the and and the face. Uh, I dr- that I don't. Oh, okay. I, the face. Well, I don't mean complete all, human anatomy. But I mean, like, I don't know any human anatomy because I I don't okay. like do any okay. like drawing. In fact, the human face has always like been a mystery to me that we can all look so completely different. And um, so anyway, j- just a correction. No, I, I do not know okay. the face very well. Good. I've been drawing caricature. And I've done it at fairs. I've done it at events. I've drawn, I do portraiture. I do landscape. I do figure drawing. I've drawn the human face a lot. And when I look at, and you've seen caricatures, you know, like political satire cartoons and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. If you were to satirically exaggerate that daguerreotype and then take some of the paintings and we're not just talking about the death mask. We're, we're, we're comparing the death mask to a lot, some of the portraiture of the prophet. And if you were to exaggerate that in a caricature yeah. and take those and put them together, they would be two completely different people. And that's, yeah, that, that's what I go by. That's actually an interesting perspective. And I think you're, that's probably, yeah, it's pretty good because, um, The person in the daguerreotype does not look at all like any of the other images that we or any of the other paintings and stuff that we have of Joseph Smith, like not at all, really, in my opinion. So that by itself, like it's like the whole um, Occam's razor thing where it's like if it doesn't like on the surface initially kind of seem like that's the case and it's probably like, not the case. <laughs> if it doesn't hit you like that in the face, in other words, yeah. If you to think about it too much. Is that what you mean? Yeah. It's just like wh- whatever kind of like seems to be right when you have kind of like a consensus and that's pr- most likely the right thing. Right. And so yeah, like we saw in the poll, uh, the majority of people don't think that it's Joseph Smith. So I, that's that's not to say you know my mind is I, I'm open to the other possibility but again I don't care that much about it but right. I, I guess we'll just see that the thing that I'm more interested about <clears throat> is when we actually see him uh, when the resurrection happens which I, you know I think will be soon uh, I did a poll on my channel about how long do you think uh, how long I think I just did it like in a live stream how long do you think we uh, is how long do you th- how f- <laughs> spit it out jared <laughs> oh my gosh uh do you think we're close to the second coming and how long do you think it's going to be and it seems like the vast majority of my viewers or at least people that responded think that it's like five to ten years so that means that whether it's at adam on Amen or after that point we're we're going to actually see what he actually looks like anyway. Absolutely. So. And it's a beautiful thing. Even if that is not the prophet, it's bringing feelings. It's, it's, it isn't it kind of resurrecting the prophet in some ways. Uh, and the reason I, I'll tell you why I just said that uh, we had a test and the last fast and testimony meeting. Uh, I noticed that everyone was getting up and, and sharing, and, and this is not a bad thing necessarily, but they're sharing their testimony of, of one aspect of the gospel. I remember a time where people would close with, I know the church is true. I, I know that uh, Joseph Smith was a prophet of God. And, and they would end like that. And a lot of the testimonies you know, I know that Jesus is the Christ. I know the Book of Mormon is true. And I know that Pro- Joseph Smith was a prophet of God in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And no one was talking about the prophet. Um, and then finally, one guy got up and I, I turned to my wife and I was like, no one ever talks about Joseph Smith being a prophet anymore. <laughs> Hardly, you know. And then, yeah. and then somebody got up. This was actually the 4th of July weekend, I believe. Uh, and, and finally somebody got up and they were talking about the declaration of independence and the constitution. And they mentioned 
the prophet Joseph Smith and because I was getting ready to get up and bear my testimony just so I could testify of the prophet. But, um, but yeah, this daguerreotype is, it's interesting how it's conjuring up feelings, almost bringing the prophet back to our, our forefront, the forefront of our minds. Yeah. You bring up a good point. I'm not sure the last time that I heard somebody bear their testimony of Joseph Smith, I, I could have just missed it. I don't know, but I can't, I can't like really remember the last time that I heard that. And yeah. he's so, you know, he's so crucial. You know, he's, he's the prophet of our dispensation. He is the Moses of our days. And I can't remember who said it. I think it might even be in the doctrine and covenants. And, and that's really bad that I don't know that for sure. But it's okay. it said that he's done more than Jesus Christ himself to bring salvation to humankind. Yeah. And um, wasn't that you Brigham know, Young? I, I, I think, think so. I yeah. think so. And, and he really has. He really has because like by the numbers he has um because i recently did a video about uh populations and looking at historical not just like this dispensation but looking back in time to like uh book of mormon times and um the jaredites as well as well as new and old testament times and the church has never been very big never 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 um the most that it may have gotten to uh, is during the time of um, third Nephi. Well, after third Nephi, uh, after Christ came, because, you know, th there's some numbers recorded there uh, as far as, well, not in like toward the end, like when the Nephites were destroyed, we have some numbers there. And I was reading one. You mean as population wise? Is that what yeah, you're talking population about? Population wise. Okay. There was one estimate that they could have easily had up to like 110 million of them, uh, which is way, way bigger than any other time in, in the church's history from Adam until now. We don't know a whole lot before the flood, like how many people were part of like Enoch and his city, you know, but it was a city. And when we're talking about ancient times, you know, we have like city states, so we don't really know, but probably not more than like millions, you know, and then um, with Jewish, like I, I was watching, I was looking into some stuff about Jewish populations and the height of Jewish population until recently was 16 million. And that was just be, that was before the Holocaust. That was like the most throughout history that they ever had was 16 million. And, and that's so, about what they are today. Well, they're below a little below that. Yeah, they've kind there's of six rebounded. million Jews in the United States and there's six million members of the church. Did you know that in yes. the United States? <laughs> yeah, I, I've done some recent videos about that, actually, because of where those two population centers are located. Right. Um, because <clears throat> think about this. OK. Right now, there's like different figures for how many Jews there are in the world because they they have like the core Jewish population, people that identify themselves as Jews. Um, and then you have kind of like the extended where it's like, oh, yeah, I'm descended from uh, Jewish family. And then you have extended from that where it's like, oh, yeah, I might have some ancestry or, you know, there's like different things. Right. Um, but the core is that like 50, a little over 15 million. So it is interesting that we have a similar, similar world population as well as a similar United States population that got me to thinking, look at this. Okay, so <clears throat> I was thinking about the camp of Israel. You know, the camp of Israel, right? And the, yes. there was a tabernacle in the center. You had the different tribes around it. Ephraim was on the very far west side. Judah was on the east side. In the United States, what you have is Ephraim primarily in Utah, okay, in the surrounding states, and Jews in this country are primarily in the New York, New England area, and then Missouri, you know, the tabernacle is in the center. It's between both of those, and so That's I kind neat. of think that there might be some kind of thing to that. Um, that's and then Manasseh, like, Manasseh's to the south of us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know if that has anything to do with it, but what you were talking about. But 
it actually could because Manasseh was south in in the camp of it because you that's had interesting ben, you had benjamin north and then ephraim and then manasseh i didn't even think about that <laughs> so it, it's just like i don't know there there's so many things <laughs> there's so many things to yeah. study well but, and then you had uh what did they say that what the if your mother is jewish yeah that's are, how they do it yeah right yeah how did that interview go by the way with the uh Oh, it, it went good. It yeah. went really good. Um, I, I, it, it's like, it's so, I think, I really think that this is one of those instances when in general conference, this last general conference, president Nelson was like, as part of his like five aspects of gaining and then maintaining spiritual momentum. One of them was expect and look for miracles. I didn't contact these, these guys at Israel 365. I, yeah. I did this video where I used a bunch of their articles to kind of put together a timeline of progress toward building the third temple. And it went really big and somehow they caught wind of it. And then they wanted to do this. And so it, it's like a miracle. I was like, I found myself in a situation, Troy, where I was discussing the word of wisdom with an Israeli Jew. And that's not a conversation I ever thought that I'd have in my lifetime, because <laughs> there was a point where we were talking about the, the law of or the word of wisdom. And um, he was just really good. And then um, he posted the interview on Israel 365. And then they got me set up with this, like they're doing this program where I, I, I'm not sure if I fully understand it yet, but basically they contacted me again and they set me up with a rabbi and we're going to do like every other week, we're going to do a scripture wow. study. To wow. Together. That's amazing. Jared, because Israel 365, like, even I bet you like feel the spirit. Sorry. I bet you feel the spirit too. When you're talking to them, this is definitely God sent. Yeah, that's amazing. It is. Um, it's kind of amazing because I focus a lot on Judaism on the channel because I think that it's important for us, even though um, we're similar religions, uh, you know, they obviously have some things that are not correct according to our theology. But when the second coming happens, we're going to come together as a people, the Northern kingdom, us are, we're going to join again with Judah and so it's, and it's not just going to be like all of a sudden, it'd probably be really helpful for all of us to kind of like understand their belief system, uh, to, to help that transition. And, uh, I, I think it's just like good to know as much as possible about them. So this is like an amazing opportunity. I think it's because Israel 365, even though they're a for-profit company, they're a media company, I think their like goal is to their like mission is to build bridges with other faith communities. Their main audience is evangelicals, but um, it's almost like they're doing a work for Israel to help people be more friendly toward Israel, which right. they don't need to convince us, but I'm happy to. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, no. So, and it, I think they find us very intriguing because even with, does he know about like some of the, uh, the media things that you know the the media uh exposure like for instance when we took some of the prominent jewish uh local leaders through the was it the oakland temple uh before it was dedicated like we do things like that and then i know jeffrey r holland um and uh oh my goodness i'm forgetting an apostle's name elder cook Yes. Yeah. Elder I, Cook yeah. is, yeah, yeah. is really, and, and Holland, like they're friends with, uh, you know who I'm talking about. He's a, he's a big time Jewish. Uh, yeah. Robert uh, Adams, right? Yes. Yes. The, the New York, he was the New York state attorney general. Yeah. Yes. And then remember the commemoration they had, was it 2015 or 16 in Jerusalem? Yeah. Where they they it was the uh remembering Orson Hyde when he came and dedicated the land of, of yeah. Palestine to uh the the you know 
to the building of a temple there someday mm -hmm. and the gathering of the Jews. Um, and, and, the, and he was there as well. That, uh, what, what's his name again? Robert Adams. Yeah. Robert Adams. Okay. Yeah. They, they recently, one of the videos that I did is like this year, they gave him the uh, An award. Yeah. Thomas Kane award. D did you know who Thomas Kane was? I didn't know until I no. did the video. <laughs> He's like, a he, during the, um, okay he was in the union army i can't remember if he was a colonel or a lieutenant colonel but anyway he was like a very fr he was very friendly toward the church and he helped the church with things it, it was partly because of him that the mormon battalion uh was formed um so anyway they they have this award for for friends people that are have done significant things for the church that are outside of the church and so he like um, won that award, but um, the, yeah, the I didn't even I was, know that award existed. <laughs> I didn't either. It's the first time I ever heard of it. But uh, this this guy Adam Berkowitz, he's the one that I interviewed. He didn't know he didn't know a whole lot about the church, and actually, it seemed like when I was talking to him, he was like kind of surprised by like our interest in Israel. We talked a little bit about patriarchal blessings and being adopted, or having your lineage declared through wow. different tribes, but like he really liked that. And, um, but he did know, watch him convert. <laughs> no, I don't know. Now, just to be clear, uh, we're, we're obviously not proselyte. No, 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 absolutely not. Yeah. Sorry. But, um, just cut that part out. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, he did know about Orson Scott card. Cause I, I guess he, he likes Orson Scott Card's books. He knew that he was LDS. And then he also knew about the BYU Jerusalem Center. He he was aware of like kind of like the the disturbance it caused when like it was in the planning stages and stuff like that. Wow. So, what I did does did you guys ever talk about like messianic Jews at all? Or no. or how he okay. No, it, sometimes I wonder if there's a core if they ever, you know because they're so interested in other Christians that are pro-Israel or, yeah. you know, it, it, is it, uh, I, I wonder if they have any interest in learning about Messianic Jews. Who knows? I don't know, but you know what I suspect though? You know what I suspect about the Messianic Jews? I've done a few videos about the three Nephites, right? And it turns out that in the journal of discourses apparently there were some native americans that were having dreams about three men that told them where to find the saints and so they they traveled a couple hundred miles to meet up with joseph smith and they they got baptized this was in a discourse by orson pratt wow. and then um there's like some other story because i like i've always wondered exactly how wh what is it that they they've been doing this whole time you know for two thousand years and apparently one of their activities is they have the ability to appear in dreams. And so I've wondered about this Messianic Jewish um, movement, because if you have like, for example, if you have like John, the revelator, who's primarily responsible for that area of the world, he might be responsible for the Messianic Jewish movement by appearing in dreams, because uh, I, 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 in my video, I did, there were some people that had dreams and then they converted, uh, to Christianity and, uh, no, they didn't come looking for our church specifically, but, uh, they're, they're starting. It's like the first phase, like they're starting to realize that, that Jesus is the Christ, you know? So right, I have to wonder right. how much influence the three Nephites and, or John, the Bab or John, the revelator is maybe having, uh, on Israel. That's interesting. So, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, yeah, go ahead. No, it's uh, all, all of this is amazing. Just the, you know, you, you mentioned earlier about the second coming and the tribes. I, I, I'm a, I'm kind of a Johnny come lately, you know, I'll mention something that comes to my mind, like for instance, the significant of Judah, staying behind in israel mm -hmm. um because they were uh 
they were one of the two tribes, right? Yeah, Judah and who was it? Who were the two tribes to the south? So well, you have the ten tribes that were taken from Assyria to Assyria, right? By yeah. the Assyrians. And so then you had there's Judah. there's basically there's kind of actually let's see. There's actually kind of like four tribes, kind of. Okay, okay. The main one is Judah. The second one is Benjamin. So those are like the two tribes okay. usually that we're talking about. But they also still had Levites with them. Levites would have been spread out throughout the land. So they had Levites as well. And uh, and they're still identified to this day. Either either you're a Cohen, which is a priest, like you're a direct descendant of, of Aaron, uh, and so your last name is typically, it could be Cohen, it could be Cowan, it could be Corwin, <clears throat> Kaplan. In fact, the word chaplain comes from Cohen. Oh, the, really? The priest. Interesting. And then you have the Levites, which are the people from the rest of the tribe of Levi. And usually they'll have la last names like Levi or Levi, Le or I don't know, last names that sound like Leviticus. Levi. Yeah, sure. Leviticus. <laughs> Leviathan? No, I'm playing. <laughs> no, the reason I said Leviathan, my son's name is Levi. Oh, yeah. I call him Good Leviathan. Name. I call him Levi. I call him Levi. I call him Leviticus. <laughs> He's like, Dad, like that. what are you saying? What does that mean? I don't know. I like that. So, so you have Judah, Benjamin, and then you have the Cohen and the Leviim or the the Kohanim and the Leviim that were there so Levi and then Simeon I've looked into this because when you look at the tribal layout uh like in the back of the scriptures where you have like the pictures of the the pictures and the maps and your um you know your uh what's it called combination mm -hmm. uh it shows that Simeon <clears throat> was also in the south and in fact Simeon was like surrounded by judah it was like this little island of simeon in judah and i've like researched that and scholars believe that essentially what happened to simeon is that they probably got just kind of like assimilated into judah so you could say that simeon uh is with them as well even well, though yeah, for some reason they're not really recognized i don't know right why. so does that mean there were more than 12 tribes no that you have like the the 13 essentially okay, <laughs> like it depends. Okay. if you're talking about land it's 12 if you're talking about th this is where it get kind of gets tricky you know because first of all you have the 12 sons and then you have 12 land groups but then you take into account um all the tribes which you would have 13 because joseph is split up into two and you would still consider Levi oh, right. Tribe. Okay. It's so like if you we rec good. No, I'm sorry. We, we recognize the 12 tribes of Israel because of the sons, though. Right? Yeah. Basically. Yeah. Basically. But they all Maybe. fall in, whether there's 13, right? Ephraim and Manasseh. But they all yeah. fall under the 12 tribes. Yeah. But if you were to like, if you had everybody in the church, all like all in one place, and then you you told them, uh, let's say like during the millennium when like everything's restored completely, if you were to say, okay, everyone line up by tribe, you would have thirteen groups because you'd have Levi and Ephraim and Manasseh and then the rest of them. So I usually like to think of thirteen, but I, we mm -hmm. say twelve, what whatever. <laughs> so I got a question I want to pose to you. Uh, because I've been thinking about this lately, and I actually mentioned this in, in a, a video in the recent past, but speaking of the temple and, and the, the third temple and the reconstruction of the temple, how significant, we, we know it's important. Uh, we, we know that it's supposed to happen and that the Savior will appear in his temple. Uh, they're, they are supposed to bring carnal sacrifices back, right? Yeah. Uh, in other words, the sacrificing of the, the unblemished. Yeah. Uh, and the red heifer. 
Is that supposed to happen before the second coming? And then one more question. <laughs> Sorry. Uh -huh. Could it be the sons of Levi that already have the priesthood? Because it says it's supposed to be done by the priesthood. I, I've done a video on that okay. because I've I've heard a lot of people say, oh, the, the sons of Levi offering again in righteousness. That's just talking about, you know, members of the church that are of Levi. Now they're doing things according to the higher law. And no, that's not true. I, I looked it up. It is talking about them literally giving up sacrifice again. Joseph Smith, if you go to the teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith, he says it explicitly. And I, I still have like a couple people that like, don't, they say that like, you're reading it wrong, but he talks about blood and he talks about flesh and fat. He's like literally talking about actual sacrifices. So Joseph Smith said that sacrifice would come back and, uh, he said it's like a, an ordinance that's been happening ever since even before Israel, because we know that Adam and all the patriarchs, they offered sacrifice so that it's going to, he said it's going to be restored. And then Joseph Fielding Smith said that, yes, it's going to come back and there's going to be actual sacrifices for a while. But then after a certain amount of time, the sacrifices would be of a different nature. So that that's, the first time that I know of that you hear that is from Joseph Fielding Smith, that it's going to change to something else. And then I think Bruce R. McConkie also, I want to say that I read something from him and he, he just like confirmed that it's going to come back. So as far as like the third temple goes, you know, Bruce R. McConkie, his, what he said about it is that it would be members of the church that would build the temple. Um, which I don't know. I mean, he's apostle. I guess I'll go with that. Mm -hmm. But I also wouldn't be surprised if this temple that they're trying to construct themselves, if they are successful in doing it, you know, I, I well, that's go ahead. Okay. Cause you did another video on um, BYU, uh, the BYU center. Yeah. And how that can easily be converted to a Latter-day Saint temple. What is the significance of the third temple being built on the Temple Mount then? You know what I mean? Is is that yeah. or is that something that just the Jews believe need to happen? Okay, so there, there's kind of like a few different parts to this. Okay. Okay, first, if we think about New Jerusalem, if if the saints had been successful and were allowed to build New Jerusalem during the time of Joseph Smith there would have been a 24 temple complex. 12 of the temples would have been for the Melchizedek priesthood. 12 would have been for the Aaronic priesthood. And based on what I researched, not all the temples would have been for like traditional purposes, like we think of, like to go in and do initiatories endowments. There would be temples that would be of a different nature. Some would be like for education. Some would be administration. Some would be, so they'd all have like different purposes one would be like a headquarters temple where almost like how on temple square you have the church administration building it's based on what i read it seems like one of the temples would be for you know the leadership of the church to operate out of so having that in mind i don't know if there's going to be a temple complex in old jerusalem although i wouldn't be surprised so I could imagine a scenario where the third temple that the Jews are trying to create would actually happen and there would be animal sacrifice there in that temple uh, because it's designed for that purpose. And then I wouldn't be surprised if the BYU Jerusalem Center uh, in the millennium became like an administration or kind of headquarters temple for Christ. Because I always get like pushback from people that are like, I, I went to BYU and it, 1989 and my professor said that this cannot be turned into a temple and it's not going to be a temple and it's like yeah but you don't know because exactly this could and, later and the their Lord, professor doesn't know either. yeah professor doesn't freaking know right for all for all anybody knows the lord made it possible okay for now yes use it as a campus but then when i come you know once i come i'm going to make that building my headquarters so, because a lot of people are like, you shouldn't talk about the BYU Jerusalem Center about becoming a temple because we're, you know, why not? 
we're we're instructed not to proselyte to the Jews and it could upset the government. And it's like, no, the church is not going to do anything against the government, first of all. And I think the government understands that. We respect the Israeli government. We respect the the city of Jerusalem. We don't do sneaky things like that. Right, exactly. But that's not to prevent the Lord from saying, okay, once I come, this will be my temple. So, and, and the relationships that we're building now with the Jewish people we were just talking about a few minutes ago, um, as that blossoms, it's going to blossom on their end. We're never going to push anything. Like you said, we're always going to be respectful. But I can see things opening up later, even for yeah. us. Relationships becoming more less complex and more um um less rigid and more uh, open yeah i think so too and um one really good thing that that adam said during the interview is he was like oh when i was talking to ellie michelle and some of the other people here uh they were talking about how mormons are the only people that have not killed the only christians that have not killed jews <laughs> and so <laughs> they, they they like like us i think at least the ones that i've been talking to they they like us i like them they like us um they love our temples they like the concept of our temples too do they when, oh yeah when they go through and they're talking about the 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 uh bapt baptismal font for the dead and the the tribes of Israel, you know, the, the, the oxen yeah. being represented. Um, and like you said, at, you know, at first I was like, what, are, what I, 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 cause I don't know a lot about Judaism. Um, I've learned a little bit more about it in the last year, but we, we do have a lot in common and why, because this is the restoration of the gospel. And this is what, uh if we go back in time you know to the children of israel and the things that they were even the garb you know the temple garb is very similar to how the priests the high priest dressed right i mean yeah <clears throat> well probably the more just like the regular priests and like white robes the high right. priest would have been in the purple i mean not the high priest sorry with with the jewel the uh the gems or whatever yeah. was on <laughs> yeah yeah <clears throat> and that's one thing that's why you know some people when they go to the temple they're you know they're not prepared for certain things and it could be the temple clothing or whatever but if you like if you understood judaism and you understood how the old temple worked and the in the dress there it's like no, yeah no this makes sense this makes sense yeah uh that's how they look kind of i mean there's like variations but when you look at modern day uh kohanim uh when they do like uh rehearsal type uh, like they rehearse like a sacrifice they've done a few like sacrifice rehearsals some where they've actually sacrificed the lamb some where they haven't but every time they dress up and they're in white robes and they have a cap and they have you know so it shouldn't really be that surprising if, if you if you knew about Judaism. Another thing that I found out recently, because I'm starting to learn Hebrew, I was just like, after talking to Adam, I was like, screw it. I'm going to learn Hebrew. I'm just going to do it. <laughs> um, That's awesome. So I got Duolingo. It's an app. And it oh, has yeah. like all these different languages. And it, it's been pretty good. And there's... With the little owl, the little green owl. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And then there's this other company that seems to be the leader in teaching Hebrew and they have like, a, you can get a free account and this is not a paid pro promotion, by the way, everybody, but you go to hebrewpod101.com and you can get a free account and they teach you there. Anyway, what I'm getting to is um, I've, I've learned the alphabet. I know the sounds that all the letters make. And I wanted to just kind of like look at the uh, Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament. And I was looking at Genesis and I recognized a word and the word was Elohim. And we all know that Elohim means gods. It's literally, it's the plural for gods. And in Genesis, when it's talking about God created the heaven and the earth, it doesn't say God, it says gods. It says Elohim mm -hmm. because I'm bringing this up because the first time I read 
uh, I think it was the book of Abraham and it had its Genesis account. It was talking about the gods created the heaven and earth and the gods, this and that into my naive uneducated ears. I was like, what? This isn't what I read in Genesis. Like, why is it saying gods here? Is this like, and it caused me to like doubt a little bit the church. Like, is this like Joseph Smith just like making something up? Right. He wants to like make Genesis now fit the theology, but no, that's actually what it says in Hebrew. And when you, when you look at the transliteration, cause like it'll have the Hebrew and then it'll have the, the English translation even on this Jewish website, they don't translate it as gods. They put God as though it's like singular. And so, and then there's like these explanations to kind of like explain it away. They'll be like, well, uh, what, what God is referring to, he's talking to the heavenly court. So he's talking to his angels. Oh, okay. That's what or, I was going to ask you if they, if they believe in a polytheistic Godhead. No, they, no. them and Christians do everything that they can to explain it away. So they'll either okay. say one argument is, oh, he was talking to, you know, the angels or number two, he was talking like a Western monarch, like we will go and do this. And I will, but really you're referring to yourself, but because you're powerful and you're a, a king oh, or a goodness. queen, you're like talking in, in that the plural. Sense. Yeah. Yeah. And then the third argument was, um, uh, I can't remember. There was a third argument, but none of them are very convincing. But if in our church, it makes perfect sense. We know how, how things operate. We know the, the true nature of God and that Christ was the one that was tasked to um, create the earth and not by himself with others. So if, if the freaking thing would just be translated literally, uh, I think a lot of a lot more people would be aware. You know what right. I mean? So I think that there's yeah. value in learning about Judaism, learning Hebrew or maybe Greek if you want to like study the New Testament and you want to read the Greek. But uh, sometimes it's like if you want to do something right, you just you have to do it yourself. <laughs> and I'm, I'm wondering what other things are there in the Hebrew Bible that they translate one way? And it's like, no, that's not what it says. Why are you, why are you, why are you doing the interpreting for me? Yeah. You know, you don't need to interpret <laughs> for me. It's just, it's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the Duolingo is, is uh, I'm actually learning Spanish with that app right now. And yes, he's right. This is not um, a paid promotion <laughs> thing we're doing. There's you also, feel like it, you feel like it's working out for you pretty well. Yeah, it's okay. It's all yeah. right. Um, I haven't tried anything else to compare it to. Uh, there's also what is it called? Babel. I've uh, heard of that. Yeah, you have to that, pay for it, or is it? Free? Um, I think they have a free. You like I'm doing the paid for thing with 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 uh, Duolingo, but I don't really think you. It's necessary. Um, I don't even know what features um, I'm paying for that that uh because i did the free version for a while and i can't find the the uh, i can't distinguish between the two but uh yeah the all of those are i think we can feel um that we're approaching miraculous times you you talked about learning I know it sounds like I'm interviewing you and this is your show. Uh, <laughs> no, 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 no. I think we're both so used to being hosts. Um, but I love how you mentioned at the beginning of the program about miracles and about how uh, the prophet has exhorted us to not just uh, expect miracles, but also to learn about miracles. And yeah that's something that I'm trying to do in my own personal life, because when you think about it, the, everyone always mentions president Nelson talking about personal revelation, personal revelation. And that's important. And that's amazing. And it's beautiful. And I'm so glad he does, but he just as much in almost every talk, he's talked about miracles and we don't talk about that that much. We don't mention 
that as much that the prophet uh president nelson has mentioned that as many times as we talk about personal revelation but they go hand in hand don't they yeah so why why what's your opinion like what have your thoughts been on that like why do you think there's such an emphasis on personal revelation and miracles and, miracles. and, and what do you think he's like specifically just what are your thoughts on that i think it's uh because they are synonymous in terms where we're living in the last days, we're going to experience things where we're going to be drawing, having to draw on the powers of heaven to come down and save us from whatever we're going through, whether it's personal uh, or whether it's collective as a church. Cause I honestly believe Jared that we're, we're not going to face another apostasy. We've been promised that the, that the church is going to stay on the earth, but I believe that the, that Christ is going to full force uh, with as much urgency as God can muster up. I don't know if that sounds right. He's going to come down and he's going to take the church by the reins because I do believe that, that there are, there are, a, there's a lot of deception in, within the church. And I'm not talking about by our apostles and our first presidency, but we know that there are scholars at BYU and there are people, and, and we're divided right now. We're divided ideologically. Do you see that too? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, not to get into. It. Go ahead. Sorry. I talk about it pretty frequently on the channel, just like how, again, one of my favorite quotes of all time was from Neely Maxwell. And he said that there's some saints that have their primary residence in Zion, but they have a summer cottage in Babylon. And um, you know who those people are. You know who they are in your life. The ones that are, that seem a little bit more attracted to the world in worldly lifestyles and worldly opinions and those that don't really don't seem like they put forth a lot of effort in studying the scriptures, the gospel, so on and so forth. And so uh, I've definitely seen a lot. I'm <clears throat> kind of dismayed at how many people I served with on my mission that have given up the church and fallen away. Thankfully, it's not like it's a majority or even half, but quite a few where it's like, what, really? Are you serious? And then there's, you know, there's family members there. What about you? Have you seen a lot of people in your life, you yeah. know, fall away? Yeah. I, I, and I, and, and for the same reasons that you're talking about they're they're either, like I said, ideologically, because I ideologue, what's it? Ideology, sorry. Ideology and, and theology are, are very similar, right? I mean, you can't really have one without the other. Uh, even though I love how the brethren are downplaying politics and like saying, that's, yes, that's happening, but focus on the savior and you'll know exactly where to go. But I do see the divide. I see people, your question was, do have I seen people falling away? Uh, yeah. I, I think all of us now have a personal friend or relative or more than, and probably more than one that's either been on a mission, been married in the temple, or was once active in the church that ha wants nothing to do with it now. I, I think that all of us are, have somebody close to us and still consider them friends, still consider them friends. Yeah. Um, so, Yeah. And there's not just, you know, you and I, we've talked about, uh, and you've, you've, you're, you're, you're kind of a quasi expert in um, sociopathy and, and psychopathy and things like that. Yeah, and yeah. you've got not to go in, in, into detail on that, <laughs> but, but there are those personalities and you, we talk about the wheat and the tares. And we also over here talk about, uh, why people are leaving the church they're either either the church is not as it, it's not conservative enough 
for some people. Yeah. Yeah. And then you've got, so you've got the, the Denver snuffer type people. The, the Den, Den, have you heard of Denver snuffer? Uh, what's that? Oh my gosh. Well, he was like, he's an apostate and he's taken a lot of people with him. He's oh. believes in the fundamental teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith and, and that we've gotten away from his teachings and, and we've strayed as a church. Uh, so you've got, and not just that, that's just one extreme example, but you've yeah. got those who say the church is not conservative enough. And yeah. then you've got those who say it's, it's not as progressive enough. <laughs> you, you've got those two types of people leaving. Yeah. You know? And well, or at least those are the excuses that they're using because <sighs> you know, I, I can't stand fake people. I can't. And there's some people that do church, but they put it on as like a costume. You know, they're wearing the LDS costume because in some way it's benefiting them, whether it's socially or um, maybe they just like do a good job at LDSing. And so, you know, you have like the religious fakers that they put on a good show and so they feel good because people give him praise or validation. Like, oh, look how righteous he is. Yes. Look at how, you know, merciful. Look how much, whatever, whatever it is. Like, just like when, when you think back to the times of Christ and you had the scribes and rabbis or Pharisees that were looking for attention or power control, you have those people too. So I think what happens is... Uh, just for a lot of people, the LDS costume isn't really as beneficial as it was before. So it's just like, oh, okay, well, I'll go do something else now. Yeah, well, and and Hugh Nibley and Bruce R. McConkie and others have talked about the intellectuals of the church. Mm -hmm. Those are also those who put on that costume as well, whether yeah. they want to sell books. It, it, I noticed that a lot of like the fair Mormon community, some of them, I used to be a big proponent and 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 uh, subscribe and, and watched and and read. A, uh, I would follow a lot of people, and they still have some pretty prominent, good um, speakers. Uh, you're familiar with Fair Latter Day Saint, right? Mm -hmm. Fair Mormon. Yeah. But there's a lot of people in that community, and not just them, but the intellectual community that also put on that front. And, yeah. and they intellectualize their, their intellect gets way ahead of, of their testimony. If they've yeah. even had one at all. There's probably two groups among them. There's probably the fakers. Um, they're not, they don't even care about truth anyway. And th that may seem alien to some people, but there really are people that live their life that way. They're not concerned with truth. They're concerned with, getting attention and getting power control yeah but then so that's like the one group that there's obviously going to be those among the scholars but then there's also going to be probably like genuine people that um either confuse themselves or they get confused by other scholars you know and so they 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 may have like a testimony but it's kind of weak and so when you have like pressure coming in from your um, colleagues and stuff like that. It may override your testimony. So I think there's some people that may just genuinely get confused by their own intelligence or knowledge. In other words, order. they're, they're urgent. They're, they're fervently seeking truth, but then they get too caught up in uh, yeah. whatever well, either, they put on the shelf and took it back off and dissected it and said, no, this is wrong. <laughs> yeah. They're not following the Holy ghost. And, the, and it can cause pride because it's like, if you're a scholar, then by definition, you're a smart person or you're supposed to be anyway. That doesn't mean that you're wise, but uh, smart <laughs> in something. Right. And so there could be like that pride issue where it's like, oh, I know better because I'm, I'm so smart and I understand things so much. Fall cometh before the pride or no pride cometh before the fall. Sorry. Yeah. And that's, that's right. why that's why we have to listen to the prophet, the general authorities, because it doesn't matter how smart you are or what you think you've discovered. You're not smarter than God. And the, the prophet is the mouthpiece of the Lord. And so 
sometimes, and this is something that people struggle with, sometimes they'll come across conflicting what they believe is conflicting information. And so they're like, oh, well, I've thought about this one over here. So this has to be right. And the, the prophet is just out of touch and they just don't know. But maybe you with what, you know, your point of view, maybe you don't have the full story. You know, maybe your research or your science isn't complete or perfect, or there may be other things at play. I feel like something that a lot of people suffer from is lack of, and this is going to sound bad, but lack of imagination, the ability to like think of other possibilities. Because some people, they're very, they're, they're, perception of things is very narrow because they can't consider other possibilities. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I can't think of any good examples of that, but if you have like a scholar that can't think of other possibilities and they're just very narrow with what they've researched, then they're blind to other possibilities that they don't even know of. So that's why, that's why like whenever I do my research on the channel, you know, I come across a lot of different things, but I primarily focus on what uh, actual authoritative sources have said okay because they know something that i don't and if i don't fully understand it we'll understand it later later you know um instead of like going off into fantasy land and, and starting to like come up with my own uh theories or you know it's okay to have theories but we should just like really just be rooted in truth the prophet the scriptures the uh, standard works in the published material of the church. And you're, you're not going to go wrong. If you Absolutely. Do that. Stick to, and they say stick to the mainstream, right? Yeah. Yeah. Stick to the mainstream of the church. Um, how much time do you have left? I have all the time in the world. Okay. Can I share something real quick with you? Yeah. Uh, let me bring this up real quick. Um, I'm going to leave the artist or not the say the author let me see share can you see this yes okay uh <clears throat> deception in the last days so i found this quote from a website that i'm going to be nanny 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 i'm not going to share it yet because i want to do a video on it but people probably can type this into Google and find it anyway. <laughs> but uh, uh, it has been said, I have often heard it said at church, that the prophet will never lead us astray. I wouldn't say that I disagree with this statement, and I don't either, by the way. I believe it wholeheartedly. But when I hear it, my thoughts turn to the Jews who lived during the time of Christ. They must have said to each other, the law of Moses will never lead us astray. As long as we stay on the covenant path, everything will be fine. They felt certain that the elevator they were on would lift them up to heaven. But Moses himself had told them that a prophet would come, at, speaking of Christ, and that those who would not listen to that prophet would be destroyed. Acts chapter 3, verse 23. Despite the warning, most of the people did not recognize the promised Messiah when he appeared. This is the cost of following the crowd. Now, am I saying that that's not what I'm, does that, okay, let me slow down here. That might sound opposite of what I, we just said by sticking to the mainstream of the church. That's not what it's saying. That's not what I'm implying here, though. And I don't think that's what he's implying, that we shouldn't follow our prophet. But we are told to follow the prophet, just as Moses told the Jews to follow a prophet that would come to them or they would be destroyed. However, also, along with that, a prophet today is telling us to seek personal revelation or we would be led astray in these last days. And then Russell M. Nelson said, in coming days, it will not be possible to survive spiritually without the guiding, directing, comforting, and consulting, cons sorry, constant influence of the Holy Ghost. We've heard that many, many times. So what do you think about that, Jared, what I just read? Do you see that it's almost the same thing, that the Jews were sticking to following the law of Moses, 
but then they didn't recognize the savior. The prophets tell it, we are always told to follow the prophet. And what is our prophet telling us as we follow him? Seek personal revelation. The reason I brought this up is speaking on what we were just talking about. I think we're coming to that point, you know, with, with the deception that we see. We, all, we always used to read scriptures 30 years ago and think that they were talking about other churches and other false prophets. But those false prophets are right here within our church. Yes. <clears throat> Sorry if I so, babbled there. <laughs> no. So, I, okay. I think the reason why, because obviously there were Jews that recognized Christ. There were Jews that recognized Christ and became his disciples. Okay. A lot of times, like when we say the Jews rejected Christ, some of them did, but some of them did accept Christ. Of the group that did not accept Christ, Christ, I think there were two different reasons. And I think that this is just a general principle throughout time. One, you had the people that were <clears throat> putting on the religious costume and, um, you know, studying Torah, studying Torah. And I can't remember. I think by that point they did have the Talmud, which is, um, hold on, let me look something up really quick. Yeah, no, go for it. Okay, when was the Mishnah written? I'm I'm still I'm still trying to like learn these different things about Judaism. Okay, that that's 280. Okay, so they didn't have the Mishnah yet. Okay, what so was the Mishnah? The Mishnah is uh, <clears throat> in Judaism. They believe that the Torah, the first five books of Moses, were given to Moses on mount sinai and uh so that god gave them gave him the written torah but also an oral torah and what happened was the jews started to realize after all these different after the babylonian conquest after uh the greeks <clears throat> and their influence on israel and then after the romans they realized that they really needed to probably take the oral Torah and write it down uh, and make it written. And so it's called the Mishnah. And then the Mishnah, uh, <clears throat> there were two different books that were compiled that were commentaries on the Mishnah. One is the Babylonian Talmud and the other one is the Jerusalem Talmud. So anyway, the reason why I was thinking about this is because just throw that out the door. You had people that had the religious costume on and they were like really expert at the law. They really knew the scriptures really good. They, you know, they're studying Torah day and night. And so they thought <clears throat> that they really understood things and that they knew exactly how it was going to play out. You know, that when Messiah comes, it's going to be like this and it's going to be like this. So they created this like mental construct of how things were going to be. Okay, some of them may have been genuine people. Others may have just had the religious costume on. Mm -hmm. Either way, the thinkers had, you know, constructed this idea of what Messiah was going to be like. And so they didn't recognize him when he comes. And I feel like there's people in the church right now that do that, that get really into um, studying about the second coming and putting together timelines and putting together you know, lists of things that have to happen as though they know exactly how it's supposed to happen. And I've argued that there's prophecies like, yes, we know that this is going to happen, but you don't know how it's going to happen or what it's actually going to look like when it happens. You know, you may read a scripture and think, oh, this is pretty clear that, you know, it's going to be just like this, but maybe that's just what occurred in your brain. Maybe it's not going to happen quite like that, or maybe we're not going to know until after the fact. One of the things, for example, are the two witnesses to, um, to the Jews. There's people that think that we are going to know when that's happening, because we're going to see on, you know, the news, two men in robes that are like causing all sorts of problems in Israel and then we can just like mark our calendar and be like, okay, three and a half years. And then it's going to be the second coming. Right. There's people that think like that. 
And those are the same type of people that I would compare to these, you know, the, doctors of the law, scholars, the, the Sadducees or the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin. Yes. Yeah. That they think that they know, you know, because they they've studied the scriptures so good. So they they totally know how it's going to happen. Right. And I think that that's wrong because that's very rigid thinking. It's assuming that you understand the scriptures. It's assuming that uh, you put it all, you put it together all perfectly. So I, I do not go down that road because I think that that's why you have like these dummies that are like, well, wait a minute, this isn't Messiah. He's supposed to do this and this and this. Right. It's like, no, that's just how you read the scriptures. If you had the spirit with you, um, if you were living righteously, you wouldn't need your brain to tell you that this is Messiah. Your heart would tell you it's Messiah because you would feel the spirit. But then you have the other group that's more concerned about worldly things. And so they're not even like it's religious things aren't even on their radar because, yeah, they're Jewish or, yeah, they're members of the church. But they're, are they really? Are they really? Yeah. You think about people that are like more secularly minded. They they don't study about the second coming. They don't do deep dives into general conference talks or like really pay attention to what's happening in general conference. So you have like the two extremes, the people that think that they know so much. And then the people that just like, eh, yeah, I'm, I'm a member of the church. And so they miss it. Yeah. And don't get us wrong, brothers and sisters. We're not saying that when we do videos, we those are basically hypotheses or they're just to get us thinking, but we have to take a stance. Sometimes we'll take a stance when we do a video and we'll say, this is, you know, what I'm going to go with, but it, but never once do we ever say this is gospel truth unless it is gospel truth. Right, Jared. Yeah. Yeah. When it comes to like future things, I'm always very careful. For example, the construction of new Jerusalem, or the lost 10 tribes. What does that mean? Like, because some people are, yeah, lost 10 tribes. People are like, oh, yeah. First of all, when they come up with that idea, they infer it from scriptures, the way that some scriptures are worded. And they conclude that the only possible solution is that there's a homogenous group of people hidden somewhere. And you could do that. And maybe it's true. And it's I'm very not possible. Be, I'm not going to be rigid and say that it's not true. Because I don't know, but I have to take other things into account as well, because not all general authorities have agreed with that. I, I have examples of general authorities that have agreed with it and examples of general authorities that haven't agreed with it. I've decided to go against it for mainly two reasons. One, because more recent general authorities <clears throat> seem not believe that there's a homogenous group somewhere. Right. <laughs> and um, when our prophet has spoken about gathering Israel, not once has he ever mentioned a homogenous group. No. And in <laughs> fact, he himself, he wrote this. Um, I can't remember if it was an article or, an, or a talk. Maybe it was a talk. But anyway, he was comparing um, the original exodus from Egypt to the experience that the saints had in the early days of the church. And he used key scriptures that the group of people that believe that there's a homogenous group, they use the same scriptures to say, Oh, see, there is a, a group, you know, in, in, in the hollow earth or in the North pole or something like that. But president Nelson used those same scriptures when referring to the saints. And I've done a video about that. So anyway, I'm not going to be so prideful or bold to say that it's not going to happen. If, if it does happen, awesome, cool. Where have you guys been? That's great. If it doesn't happen, I, fine. It, it doesn't really matter. It's going to happen one way or another. You know, Absolutely. and then as far as like New Jerusalem goes, building New Jerusalem, is that referring to the literal city? Is that talking about laying out the streets? Is that talking about Kansas City and the metro area has to be nuked by a nuclear bomb and then we rebuild? Does it mean uh, the city of Enoch coming down first? Uh, or does it just mean the people, having the people that will be part of New Jerusalem? Who the heck knows? I don't know. But what, what I can't ignore are all the signs pointing to the fact that we're close. 
And the, the signs are abundant. They are abundant. They are in nature. They are in society. They are in geopolitics. They're in the church itself. You know, because I put together my spreadsheet where I track certain words and phrases in general conference. And it's pretty clear. It's pretty clear that within the last few years, there's been a heavy, heavy, heavy emphasis on the second coming, the millennium, the rising generation. Like this is like quantifiable. So I can't ignore right. that. And I can't be like, oh no, it's still going to be at least 50 years because we have to go and build new Jerusalem. We have to like, you know. It's got to be in Missouri, man. Yeah. Well, yeah. I actually do believe it has to be in Missouri. Well, yes. However, the reason I said that is the prophet Joseph Smith said that it also covered North and South America later on. That was yeah. later. He said that. And what? now yeah. we're saying it's wherever Zion. I always say Zion's wherever you hang your hat. <laughs> <laughs> but, well, that's uh, a that's another that's another thing because I do believe that the center place it, it is in um, Independence, Missouri. The reason why I believe that is there's been a lot of like quotes that I've read, not just not in the Journal of Discourses, but like recent ones. Sorry if you can hear my son in the background. It's okay. He's freaking out over Roblox. Um, <laughs> plays it all the time. Um, okay, so, uh, but on top of that, you have the Independence Visitor Center that was built to the specifications of the temple, uh, to be one of the temples of the 24 Temple Complex. And we find out about that from Alvin R. Dyer. Uh, him and the architect consulted with David O. McKay to make sure that they were constructing it in the right spot, that it was the right specification so that it could be part of the temple complex. So anyway, but to your point, for all we know, when it comes to New Jerusalem, what if New Jerusalem is currently, if there was a New Jerusalem on the earth, what if it is currently Salt Lake City? What if it's like Salt Lake City has the New Jerusalem title right now? And then Christ comes to New Jerusalem. He comes to the Salt Lake Temple. And then later, church headquarters is moved it's relocated. To, yeah. to Missouri. Right. So that's like one way about that, it, that too. That's one way that it could happen. Yeah. I think that that's why I think that's why uh, all these temples are being renovated right now and specifically the Salt Lake Temple and President Nelson is talking about it all the time. He's always using it in talks as like a metaphor and a not so subtle metaphor for like being prepared for the second coming. So I can see well, a situation where Christ comes to Salt Lake City and therefore has has uh, fulfilled coming to New Jerusalem and then later moving the the church headquarters. It's also good to remember too that Isaiah, you know, we were talking about the lost 10 tribes, um, the, the, the two witnesses, which is in um, Revelation. John spoke in what's it called? Apocalyptic style. Isaiah spoke in hyperbole, not just Isaiah. But all throughout the scriptures, it's either apocalyptic style or hyperbole. Christ used parables to describe things. There was a time where ancient Christians believed that the devil had horns. I mean, and we know, was it two years ago or three years ago, where President uh, Oaks gave a talk? I don't know if you remember. I can't remember which talk it was where he said, there's very little we know. There's really very little we know about the afterlife. Yeah, yeah. And I think that can also be uh, uh, applied to anything in, in, the, in the plan of salvation. I think what the missionaries teach us and teach investigators, or they call them friends now, sorry. On what, they call them what? Friends. Are you they serious? Yeah. They're not investigators anymore. They're our friends. No. Yeah. When, when did that change? Oh, wow. I know. Uh, I think like a year and a half ago. Uh, I, I wasn't aware of that. That's yeah. Interesting. It's okay. our friends. Um, I think my wife's given me signs that she's got to get up and do stuff, but I'm in the living room. Is it okay if we wrap this up? And... Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. 
that wasn't a very that was a very rigid way to wrap it up huh? but that our friends i know i have a hard time saying that too <laughs> uh even though they are our friends um what was i saying what was i talking about um, um oh well, we, that there's very little we know and that i think that the things that that the missionaries teach uh their people is uh are the main things that we do know i mean yeah. even orson pratt was chastised by brigham young in the first presidency by some of the things that he said that were recorded in journal of discourses the first I, presidency said they did not sanction a lot of what he said can you send that to me yeah i absolutely I, I have noticed that specifically orson pratt compared to all other <laughs> early general authorities he is always talking about these kind of more um gospel hobby type subjects but the reason they did that is because there was no entertainment like television there was nothing there was yeah. nothing there nobody was publishing books nothing so you've got this little utah church in the middle of utah territory nothing else around you you have no contact with the outside world all you could do was have a school of the prophets going on up here and coming out here for three hours a sermon you know yeah. what i mean and so it was built on the Holy Ghost. The spirit was present. And it's kind of like the 10 tribes. At one time, they believed that they were a, uh, what did you, what was the word you were using? A what people? Like a homogenous, a homogenous group. group of people. It, they would fill the spirit when those things were spoken, but they, they could only visualize with their mind's eye what that really meant because they didn't live in the last days. Did Joseph Smith know about the internet? Who knows? You know, I, I honestly don't think that Joseph Smith, uh, I don't know if he saw everything in our day because he never mentioned the internet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but anyway, know of, I digress. But we, yeah. Well, anyway, with Orson Pratt, uh, the thing with him, though, is that he gives actual discourses to congregations and says things very like matter of factly uh, like one of the things is about like the 144,000 which I have a whole playlist about the 144,000 but you know he said very matter of factly that there's gonna be those in this congregation that give them their endowments right well the way that some people conceptualize the 144,000 is that literally the homogenous group of the tribes have to come and then a literal 12,000 people have to be selected from each tribe. And when I say people, I mean high priests from each tribe. And he said that that's going to happen in his lifetime. And uh, that hasn't happened unless he didn't have a full understanding of what that meant. Because what I right. found with the 144,000 is that it seems to refer to people that are doing the work of, uh, a bit of exaltation. So like temple workers, people that are giving, administering, uh, the higher ordinances. And I, I have reasons why I say that, but it's, it's in my videos. I can't like bring that all up now, but we're, we're about to end anyway. So, yeah. And, and I think that those sermons are kind of like patriarchal blessings or, or personal revelation. There are things that our minds tell us and then the spirit and we pick up things. Um, a stake president friend of mine said that um, when he gives blessings, Sometimes it can only be one or two things in that blessing that actually came from the spirit. Some of it could have come from your own mind, yeah. but it doesn't mean that the gospel isn't true, brothers and sisters. It right. just means that we're learning line upon line, precept upon precept. Our apostles are learning. Our first presidency is learning. We're all learning together, right, Jared? Yep, yep absolutely. Thank you so much for this opportunity yeah. to talk to you again this has been edifying it's been too long nice. we'll have to do it again you know i, I kind of get worn out by the interviews I, i've been kind of like wanting to do the the women in the church because i feel like a a need to do that yeah but that's I, cool i, I want to like i can only do so many interviews at a time and then i just kind of get stressed but i'm glad that we we were able to do this and i want to do it again in the future 